Uh, now, down here in eastern uh, U.S., there is the, a new uh, alliance for, for uh, window restorers called the New England Window Restorance Alliance. And they sort of have like a top ten thing from like Dave or Letterman, why to restore windows. Um, first one being because it fits your house. It's already there. It's the original design intent, whoever designed it, it's already there. So if, with a little bit of tweaking, can we make this work for today's purposes? Second reason, you appreciate good craftsmanship. Antique windows are made with mortise and tendon joints, uh, which make them incredibly strong, and th the ultimate proof is they've lasted 100 years already. I think that's a pretty good test. I'm, I think you'd be pretty hard or pretty pressed to find any technology that's lasted 100 years, or any window manufacturer willing to give you a 100-year warranty. You value good materials. A lot of these windows are made from a, uh, the lumber was originally harvested from an old growth forest. Well, what does that mean? Well, an old growth forest or an ancient forest was a very cloistered forest. It was very populated with trees. So these trees had to fight for light. And you can, if you take a look at the image here, you can see the density of the cellulose. So the finer ringed sample of wood means that each dark ring is usually the winter time when the growth slows down. And in the summertime, when you see that light color ring, that's the summer, it's going crazy. So when you get harder, denser rings together, it's less likely to rot. Because you love the character of antique glass. Before Piltington glass, there was uh, what we call non uh, imperfect glass or non-Piltington glass, sometimes called heritage glass. We used to call it crappy glass. Um, now they call it heritage glass and they charge twice as much for it because it costs <laughs> twice as much as good glass. I go down to something called a traditional building show and uh, attended several restoration courses. And there are guys actually running around uh, to people's uh, gar uh, garbage cans and seeing old window sashes and, and stealing them because what they're doing is they're salvaging these pieces of glass. Number five, same thing I mentioned before, because you believe that uh, you know, a window warranty should last more than 20 years and uh, so you should have seal failure in that point. When you have a uh, heritage window, there is usually no thermal pain, but usually you have double glazing. The double glazing never fails, so there's no thermal pain to throw away. We're all reading a lot of articles about the nastiness of PVCs and what they do and what they do to the environment. Uh, you'd like, definitely like to try to limit some of that because you want more light, number seven. Most of the time when someone asks for someone to replace their heritage windows, the, the lazy installer's way of doing that is basically taking off a sash stop, removing the sashes, and putting a window inside another window uh, jam, thereby, thereby reducing your visible glass area by about two inches all the way around. Because windows are a functional part of your house. If uh, you want to make them more functional with weights and pulleys, the simplest balance system ever invented, they're easily repairable, last longer than in today's balance systems, most of the weight pockets are sealed by paint and caulking inside and out. When you seal the air, you seal the energy transfer. That's where you're going to realize bulk of your energy savings. No air loss, no heat loss, no energy transfer. You can even weather strip the pulley cord, and I'll be showing some examples of that. Because you want to save 30 to 40 percent on your heating. I mean, uh, again, we talk about heat loss and air loss. Um, if you have a brand new window and you're comparing it, I think, um, I don't know who's done the study, but I think it was Tony Woods that done the study. The low ER gun is going to grab you maybe another 5 to 10 percent extra energy savings. So I'm going to sort of try and prove here for a little bit of um, labor and stuff, we can get almost 95 percent there. Considering that we're dealing with probably a compromised structured system or a compromised house, meaning that it's not 100% sealed, I think that's a significant improvement on it and that and a, lot, a little bit of maybe building envelope details by sealing the building envelope, you can really get a long way. Uh, it also mentions here that the um, uh, U.S. Army Cold Regions Research Laboratory um, sort of did a good storm window uh, and old heritage window versus a replacement window and instead there was about 60 cents difference over the year. Because the greenest building is the one that's already built. The building's there, um, you know, do you, do you need to rip it apart or gut it <laughs> to get it to, to a point where, you know, you're going to realize some savings on it. Here's a quote from someone from the National Trust Historic Trust Preservation. We can't build our way out of global warming. We have to conserve our way out. 
It means making better, wiser choices of the things that are already built. Okay, so here we go. Um, here's the anatomy of a window. This is probably the most common window you're going to run across. It's a double hung. Um, what I'd like to show you here, if this will work, uh, the critical areas that we want to be concerned with with weather stripping. The different parts I really want you to pay attention to are the meeting rails here, where the two meeting rails meet, um, the sash pulley cavity down here. Um, there's a little piece of wood that runs all the way down here called the sash stop. Uh, typically those are the parts that we're going to deal with when we're dealing to try and uh, retrofit some weather stripping and stuff along those lines. So this is just a quick diagram showing some of the potential leakage passages of air, um, um, both on the inside and, and the outside. And here's a, sort of a little uh, synopsis of some of the materials we're using. Um, to th there are some more modern materials that we can apply to these older uh, heritage windows. One of them being a latex acrylic based glazing compound. One of the unique qualities of this, it's unlike the old uh, calcium carbonate I think it was compounds, is that they never actually set up hard. They actually stay somewhat soft in the center. They cure in as little as four hours and I can top coat them with latex paint uh, and th at that point. Uh, to make the windows function more easily in the, their runners, we often are using uh, sealing wax or what we call canning wax or paraffin wax. And we sort of rub that up and down the sides of the sashes and in the groove. And you'd be surprised. Once you've done that, you relieve a lot of the friction that is associated with painting these, uh, these uh, sashes shut. Uh, we're also using uh, over here, you can see this example of what we call C-fold fo polyflex weather stripping. Uh, one, this side here has an adhesive tape on it, and then this side just sort of bounces out and pushes itself against sashes and stuff. We're just not going to rely on a, uh, a connection to the uh, jam with just a, a, a adhesive. So we use stainless steel staples here. And if you're in a, um, uh, a corrosive environment like the seacoast, you can also get Monel uh, staples, which is uh, a totally rust-proof staple. But these windows are so easy to service. Um, I often tell my clients, if you just want me to come in and connect the sash cords and put the weather stripping on, I could do it for at least, uh, as little as 150 to $200, $250. A lot depends on the condition of the window. Sometimes the upper uh, sashes have been painted, down, uh, painted stuck lower, so we have to release that upper sash. And that's going to drive up the cost a little bit more. But that's just the weatherization. I'm also going to show you how you can do the extreme makeover to the windows by removing the lead-based paint on it with a very uh, uh, um, interesting uh, mechanical action. Here's a uh, slide from Zero Draft showing the appropriate locations for the C fold and how they integrate. If you have a casement window, which is more like a door, you're going to have that, this side type of detail. If you have a double hung window, which slides up and down, you may put it in here if there's enough room, but often I'm putting it here beside, behind the sash stop because uh, I can variable, vary the uh, tension of the sash stop against the, or the, how much compression I can put against the sash. Time of year I really like to do this um, is usually around winter time because uh, up in Ottawa we get down to um, uh, below zero degrees Celsius so we can automatically tell by just running our hand around the sash if we've made an appropriate seal. I don't need to do a blower tell our door test or anything. I can feel the cold air coming in. Often associated with double hung windows are these little small secret pocket doors and I'm not sure if anybody's aware of this. This is the um, uh, sash stop and this is what we call the parting bead. The parting bead is basically the piece of wood that separates the two sashes from each other when they slide. And sometimes you have to remove the parting bead to get the door out, but sometimes you do not. Uh, on, the, on this right hand side is an example of a storm window. A uh, storm window can be one single sash or it can be divided into two different sashes with a removable bo bottom part that's a, for a screen. From this uh, New England uh, Restoration Association, they also have a uh, sort of uh, historical guide of traditional muttons. Muttons are those little grill-like um, decorative elements that sort of divide up the window into different little pieces in the sash. So they have, may have different little shapes and profiles uh, along those lines. And I'm going to go next on to the different bits and pieces to a window. And a lot of the stuff we can still 
get. I mean, it's, it's not like it's not available. A lot of pe people in the restoration business have access to this and still be made today. Um, if you don't want to um, constantly pull off caulking and nails out of your sash top, which is this little piece of, of wood that goes to hold the sash in, you can get a stop bead adjuster, which is basically a screw, and you put a slot in your uh, sash stop, and you can adjust this uh, stop back and forth to give you more compression or less compression. Uh, you need to lift the, stash, uh, the sashes, so you're gonna be using either a finger pull or a flush pull or a handle pull. Sash uh, stays or stops uh, if you want to uh, stop the sash from falling down or you want to lock it in position. There are ventilating sash locks that you can still get today and use. You can have security. These are some of the decorative locks that are made today. We can get the pulley wheels. These are very uh, various examples of different styles of different ages of pulley wheels. Sometimes we have chains on them. Sometimes we have cotton cord. Uh, also, some of this technology down here is coming up to its 100th anniversary, being made in 1932. There's these uh, spiral balances that are still being made today. Uh, this is a cable pole that will, uh, will, uh, uh, that will raise and lower your sashes for you that's made in California. Um, this is a um, spring pole, which I was unaware that was made back in 1886. So I mean, it's a, a very robust technology. If they're still selling it today, someone's buying it. Um, a lot of comments been made on, well, I, I've got a dra drafty pulley wheel. Well, some people are still making, there's a special cover here on the back side of this pulley wheel to air seal airtight the sash cord for you. Here are some of examples of cords. This one, if you have a 2,000 pound sash, we can do it, okay? So these, got, these cords here have cable, have steel cable inside them. One of them has stainless steel in them, so, you know, you tell me what you want. <laughs> so we also can get different decorative colors to this, uh, the chains. Um, this is some of the attachments on the end of the sash. Usually, typically, there's a little hole drilled here. If you have a cotton cord, you're typically putting a knot in there with the cotton cord, and that's how it fastens, fastens to the cast iron weights. Here's one that you can sort of cut the different chunks off to determine uh, what exact weight you need. If you have uh, casement windows that open like doors, here are some of the sash stays that you can use because typically the wind's going to try and blow it or uh, blow the, the casement for you, but you want to keep it fixed so you can have a, a, an accurate ventilation. So here are some of the different casement stays that you can have. Here are some of the casement locks. Uh, here are some of the bolts that you're going to find on casements usually, and this is a sort of what we call a French uh, casement hardware that's sort of uh, rem reminiscent of the three-point locking hardware you find on doors. We can even get transfer transom window operators today. You can see the transom window here that pivots in the center, and we can get these pivots today. Uh, here's some of the transom locks, and here's a transom hook that you can use to operate those locks, and some other transom stays if you don't have an operator. Um, next uh, thing at task is the uh, storm window, and this is where it gets kind of interesting. This particular manufacturer builds a wood storm and actually puts aluminum sliding, uh, aluminum st uh, storm window hardware that allows the uh, lower uh, glass slash to slide up and re reveal a window. So typically you're not taking your storms on and off. They're typically living on the, on the structure itself. Here's how he's managed some of the details on his wood storm. So from the outside, it looks like a normal wood storm. It looks like a, from a heritage house. So you can still uh, you know, get the same benefit of the double glazing. Uh, and he's, offer, he's offering these storms in low E. And he's also mentioning here that you know you get that perfect reading through of the different panes so that um, everything looks consistent because you can specify I want mutton bars in this uh, stuff. Here's another manufacturer. Um, the way she, they've handled this is that this is a wooden uh, sash. There's removable panels on the back side. The storm still stays there. Um, this is more probably typical of if you have a double hung window, that's when the upper sash goes down also. And when we get into those cases where we're trying to activate the double hung, uh, 
both uh, parts of the storm window are accessible to us, the top part and the bottom part. So then at the top part, we can take out this little glazing panel and put in a screen panel. So now if you really want to cool off your house in a heritage house, you really want to drop the upper sashes because the air, hot air that's all collected up there is going to be vacated out of the room a lot quicker. Here are some of the storm hardware that you, can, you might run across. Uh, you've all probably seen what I call a, a, I call it a sort of like a butterfly button that holds the storm into place. Uh, you're often seeing these hangers at the top, and you're also seeing these ventilated uh, these. Uh, permanently holding open stays to help ventilate at the bottom if you don't have a screen. Uh, these uh, storm hangers here are stainless and these are uh, what they're called sash clamps and they sort of, instead of using a hook, you use these clamps to keep the storm in. Traditionally in the uh, past, these are some of the tools and techniques we've used to try and get the lead paint off of, uh, off of windows and, and buildings. A grinding action, a planing action, um, this is a infrared, um, this is a heat gun. Typically, they're bringing the temperature surface up to, you know, this one I think is an 1800 watt uh, heat gun, and you're bringing it up way over 200 degrees Celsius. Uh, some people use torches, this is a, this is something similar to the stove element that you have, uh, power washing, strippers. The new technology we're using now seems to be everywhere else. It's steam. You see steam ovens, you see steam dryers, you see steam rice cookers in, in, in Japan. Apparently they use autoclaves, to, to, uh, which are steam cookers uh, under pressure to cook things real quickly. The other technology we're using is this is a technology from the boat refinishing industry. It's a hollow scraper that you attach to a hose and attach to a vacuum. So as soon as you scrape the paint, it gets sucked up into a HAPA vacuum cleaner. One of the technologies I'm going to be showing you is this homemade um, a steam box. Basically, it's poly -iso board with uh, aluminum foil on it. You should use some aluminum foil tape. And we use these industrial garment steamers. And we make a little hole in the back, uh, back part of these. And the steam comes up the back hole. I, I put mine slightly on an angle. So a, as it condenses, it can start to run back down to the hole so I can reprocess the water. Using steam makes it more uh, safer, more efficient uh, alternative because the steam softens the paint film. You can, once you soften the paint fill, it makes it more easy to scrape the paint. But typically the way we're doing it, we're, baking, we're harvesting the sashes, we're taking them uh, outside, using the steam, box, uh, steam box outside. Um, we're steaming them from about four to six hours. And what, in that process, the putty goes to mush. You just take a small flexible blade and it just falls right off. So at that point, we can harvest all the wavy glass. There's no glass breakage or very minimal, minimal glass breakage. Then we let the sashes dry out for about uh, 24 hours. And someone's done a, um, a moisture test and we find that the moisture almost 100% uh, the, the sashes are the same moist before we started with the steam as after we started uh, after, after, afterwards. It's very dried out. So it's down to uh, probably about uh, five to six percent, which is, is what you want to see in wood. This being a wet process, it's already wetting uh, a potential hazard. Um, also, because uh, a lot of the putties used to contain um, uh, asbestos in it, we also have to be conscious of that. And since it's a very wet process, it's also controlling that part of that hazard also. The steam that we're typically getting out of these uh, um, garment steamers, it's not a high pressure steam, it's a very mild steam. But I think the, the, the way the steam works is you can, if, you, uh, if, you, if you ever had a steam burn compared to another burn, it's a nasty burn. Uh, and part of the reason is the steam, whatever it's contacting, if, you, if you're getting a steam burn on your skin or if, whether it's a window sash, the steam sees that as like a nice ice cold glass of beer. It's gonna suck itself like they could do on an ice cold glass of beer right to that uh, material. So like if you're putting a sash in a steam environment, it's like a, an ice cube, so all that steam instantly collects to the object. And the, the biggest issue is try not to let the water collect on the surface because you want to run it off the surface so the steam can still penetra actively penetrate. As soon as you get enough surface water on it, its effect starts to diminish a little bit. This is a house uh, in uh, Gatineau, which is just opposite Ottawa, over across a river. 
Um, typically you see these older houses, it's done in the Bose art style. This is a typical condition that you're seeing of the houses, in, I mean the windows. You see the putties, you know, partially there, not there, and the, wind and the paint on the windows sometimes are, is leaving. Um, this is what we did afterwards with a, we also did the porch here, but if you take a look, this particular house had an interesting window condition. Um, most of the storms were missing, so we ordered the storms, but it had a double hung plus an interior set of, of storms. You're seeing me uh, place up there a, a fixed window that goes, goes on top, and it had these removable casements on the interior. And you can see the split hinge here. And so you can see me putting on the, um, the, the, the split hinge. So they remove, you can remove that, or you can let it sit there uh, all year. It's up to you, but it, it's, it's one of the first times I've ever seen this type of arrangement. Uh, and in a sense here, you're getting triple glazing here. <laughs> <laughs> an early form of triple glazing. We went with a low E, uh, low, a low e uh, storm on the outside. Um, uh, one of the unique, one of the interesting things, as soon as we put on this third panel, the sound through the window dropped. Oh, they were doing construction outside. We could not hardly hear anything. The only sound we got was a low bass sound you get through the, the structure itself, but it was dead quiet. On this system, the only thing that I really actively weather stripped was the double hung. The, uh, I wanted the st storm window to actively leak. If we try to weather strip everything super airtight, at some point, you're going to get condensation stopping. Okay, so that's why I actively let the storm, it's, it's a controlled, controlled leakage, it's not like we're just, you know, letting a whole bunch of it. So we're sort of buffering it in, in between these two interstitial cavities. The interior storm is sort of, uh, um, you know, buffering it a little bit, but the, uh, the reason why I chose the double hung is it's, that's the original intention. It's, uh, I don't want to make it the sacrificial window, if you know what I'm saying. We want to make the storm sacrificial to the, to the main window. This is another, one of the first um, window jobs we did. Um, this is Filament Terrace in Ottawa. It's one of the first he heritage designated properties in Ottawa. It's a row house. There's these several, there's about six of them and they have all these are uh, sort of lace type porches. And each porch, is, um, each pair of porches because they're attached together, are a different style. Um, so this is some of the effects we're getting. So you can see the before and after. Typically, when we strip these storms, once I have the glazing out, and I've stripped all off the paint, and I've used my um, uh, rotary sander with, attached to my HEPA Vest2 vacuum, so I'm not eliminating lead dust, I basically prime the whole storm, even the putty rabbit, uh, before I, I put the glazing in. I'm actually top coating everything except the putty rabbit. So when I st uh, uh, put in my, set it in my uh, glass uh, panel into a bead of latex, I've already cut one side of the window. And then all I have to do is do the other side of the window where the putty is, and I'm done. So I get certain efficiencies by st steam stripping. Uh, the cost that we were running on, uh, on that uh, previous uh, case study, I think, with the cost of the storm, and we also stripped the interior storm, so we're, sti uh, we're stripping a lot of windows there. I think that was closer to about 2,200 per window opening. Um, you know, so if you did a normal double pane system, you could get down to 1,800, 1,500. Um, if you're just doing the weather stripping, I mean, it's just, you know, two, uh, $250. But here's another example of how the window feels like it's right in that space. This is the interiors of this uh, filament terrace. And on this one, we activated actually all the upper sashes were painted shut because most people end up painting them shut. We used a transom rod to activate it because this, this window system, uh, I'm five foot nine, so I think there were almost 11 or 12 foot ceilings in there. Here's some of the hardware. You can see the before and after on the hardware. This is what, what we documented before, and we found this stuff online, which is close enough. A lot of the stuff that I do is done with heritage grants from the city, and you can see the before. Uh, this was, we replaced that hardware, but it's, you can see sort of through the paint outline, it's almost exactly the same. This house uh, had the patented uh, sash, sash lock from 1874, and I managed to find it online. Those uh, row units are actually three stories, and they go all the way up to the third floor where there's casements. On the previous um, case study, 
We, we actually installed a bathroom, continuous running bathroom fan upstairs because they had a fresh air dump into the furnace. And I just wanted, as you weather rise, you want to sort of keep the air moving <laughs> a little bit. So uh, this, uh, it was a Panasonic fan if you want to know, but it just continuously ran and then it bumped up when you had a moisture event.